and we are starting to stream right now. Um, so welcome, everybody. We're, we're on a few minutes early just to get people warmed up the opportunity before we start to get on. So um, welcome wherever you are. Um, you know, I, I hope that you are enjoying your day. Um, and I'm just going to go out and make sure that uh, YouTube has us active and everybody has us active. Um, you know, nobody's uh, quite logged on just yet, but that's okay. Um, so, Charlie, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks, Matt. How about you? I am doing pretty well myself. I am. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, the fun thing about um, today is my heat went out this past weekend. And so the heating guy's downstairs. So um, it will be interesting to see if he decides to come up while we're doing the live stream. So you, you never can tell what is going to happen on one of these, right? Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's one of those, 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 those things. So um, I do see we, we starting to pick up a, a, a person or two. Um, so welcome those who are here, um, you know, appreciate you hanging out with us, um, you know, today and let's see. So today, Charlie and I are actually going to be talking about Postgres. Um, oh, Gonzalo's here. Hi, Gonzalo. So I'm glad that you uh, found us and you saw that we uh, we went live. Um, you know, we're, we're also on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Twitch today. So, you know, welcome if you're joining us on one of those. Now, uh, Charlie, um, today we're going to be specifically taking Postgres from um, a bare bones install and trying to configure it so it has some sane beginning values. Um, we're going to be using PMM uh, to look at um, the workload and to uh, see uh, what sort of um, optimizations we can do out of the gate and see what sort of performance improvement we can get um, as we go. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, Charlie is the Postgres tech lead here at Percona. So uh, he does all kinds of fun stuff Postgres related. Um, and for our discussion today and for our stream, we're going to be using uh, Percona's uh, Postgres 13 distribution as well as PMM. Uh, if you do have questions, this is an open forum. Feel free to ask your questions uh, here. And if you do like this and you want more content on how to tune, fix, optimize, do whatever with Postgres, MySQL, or Mongo, um, go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe, put a comment in here. Um, we would appreciate it. Um, so, Charlie, um, why don't uh, why don't I turn it over to you and why don't we get started? Yeah. Well, thanks for interaction, Matt. Uh, as you said, the idea today is for us to have a fresh installation. So let me share my screen just a second here. Okay. So uh, the idea today is we have a a box with a fresh Postgres SQL installed, right? So this is a brand new one. Uh, the, all the settings are the default settings. The only thing that we have is a database preloaded. So we have some database here, right? If we go for the Postgres, we have a couple of the database that was gently granted by Matt. So this is the database that Matt's application uses. And he went there, installed the database, started using the application, and he felt the application was running too slow. And um, why is that the database is running slow? People may ask, is not Postgres a fast database? Is not Postgres a, is a good database? It is. The thing is, uh, when we just installed the, the, the Postgres, the database, the fresh installation, the default settings, they are not optimal. So most of the default settings, they've been defined long, long time ago, where one gigabyte of RAM, it was very expensive. Well, nowadays, a lot of folks out there, they have terabytes of RAM, right? Things are getting a lot cheaper. 
And also the size of the database there is scaling quite highly. So, and what is the idea of today's talk? We're going for some of the full settings, some of the, the most common settings, let's put on this way, that we should start in to adjust to our environment. So, and we are going to use PMM to help us understand uh, what is going on, on on our box. So during those those tests, during the load, Matt will be running some some scripts, so his application. So we're gonna have some some load inside of the database, and we try to to optimize, to change the settings and see how the impact of those settings they do inside of the database. One thing that you need to keep in, in mind, Matt, is it's not rocket science. I mean, it's not so complicated to do optimization, but it's not strictly math. There is no certain rules that if I change this parameter, I'm gonna have, let's say, 50% performance improvement. So in a lot of cases, we need to go testing and checking how the things go, right? So this is one thing that you need to keep in mind. The settings that we are going to work here, they're the basic ones, the default ones. So the idea for today's talk is, okay, what are the main settings that we, we can go and take a look and change to get our database with reasonable speed and performance? Of course, there are a lot more settings that you can go over, but the time doesn't allow. So we're going to stick for four or five settings on the OS, the, the Linux kernel, because we are using Linux for the database for this session. And then we're also going to go for four or five database settings uh, to start adjusting the database for the box that we have here. And to start the database for the box that we have here, we need to understand what is the box, right? We need to see what we have in the box. So shall we start? Absolutely. All right. So as we said, we're going to use PMM uh, to help us to monitor the database, right? To do so, we need to install the PMM client and the PMM server. Well, Matt has a PMM server running, as we can see here. So I do have uh, an user here. So when we go for PMM, a lo login on PMM. After this is when you go for PMM, this is the first uh, window you see, right? The, the login. And when we log in inside of the PMM, that is Percona Monitoring and Management Tool, this is what we see when we log in to the Percona Monitoring and Management Tool, the PMM. So this is the welcome tool. Well, I don't have anything here on my PMM. Uh, actually, we do have a couple of information that's only about PMM itself. So if we go for the PMM dashboards, this is all we have here that, that we see. So I have some information that's about the PMM server, as we can see here. This is the box that holds PMM itself. For me to start monitoring my database, I need to add that box to, to the PMM. If for me to add that box to the PMM, I'm going to use a tool that name is PMM admin. So as we are uh, using, in this case, this box is Ubuntu. So we should just use a sudo app in, uh, install PMM add client on Ubuntu. I've done that before, so we can speed up stuff. And also, everything that I'm going to do here, is we can, it can be found on the PMM documentation on Percona's web page, right? So I'm going to use this PMM admin config to add my, the, the, this box to the PMM. See, here I defined the username and the password. This username and password at username and password for the PMM server itself. Uh, I created some variables, so I don't need to type the password here, right? And the host name is just the, the IP of that box. So I'm going to add here. It, it worked. So it says that it was added and the status, the agent is running. 
it's registered to the PMM server. So now we have an agent, a PMM agent running on this box here. If I go to my PMM server now, let me refresh here. And after this refresh, I can get on my Postgres summary, this is the, the summary of my database here. If I go, and this is the name of my box. Now you can that change has the, the name of the box as well when you register it. Yeah, we can. Okay. That's true. Uh, we can also change the name of the box. I, I left it like as the full because I quite easily lost myself when like I'm going to the PMM and I always try to, to find the, the, the host name here. But if you, we don't change, it's just use the, 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 the host name, right? Okay. Yep. Yep. So in my case here, uh, well, this is not the dashboard I want to show. Uh, I, I only add the the OS metrics for, for my database. If we see here, we don't have much information for, for, the, for the Postgres that's been for, for that box. Well, and this is because all, it started off and no, no workload is active, right? Yes, and also I, I need to, when we add the, the, the clients, we can, we need to add two things. This is gonna collect the OS metrics. Oh, sorry for that. This is gonna collect the OS metrics, right? The CPU, memory, IO, and this kind of stuff. So I can go here for the system metrics. I can have, for example, this node summary here. This is the OS metrics. This is the metrics that is collecting. So I can see that my box has 32 gigabytes of RAM. So has 109, 394 gigabytes of disk space and a lot of information from the OS perspective. And we also get a, a nice summary here. That's it. I have a, a Linux, Ubuntu, the kernel version, how many CPUs I have, the memory. So that client will give us information about the OS. We also want to add the, the client itself, right? For the, the database itself. So we are able to, to collect information from the, the database. And to do so, so we, we need to, to, collect information. to do so, we need to run this command here. So I just need to create a, uh, a user inside of the database. This username and this password here, they're going to be the database username and the database password that PMM will use to connect to to my database. So I just open a new session here that you guys cannot see right now. And I will create this user, this PMM user here. So just a second. All right, and I've All right. I should have this up and running. Let's see if that works. So if that works, yep, the services was added. So now I have the database itself inside of the PMM. So if I go again here for Postgres. If I want to have a Postgres overview, I should be able to get some data here from, from my database, for, from my instance. So how many active connections you have, how many, much memory of the database, the, the vacuum, a lot of information we, we have here from, for the, the database for Postgres inside of PMM. We can also, change here the view that we, we get on top here. This is from what we've seen before, right? So 
more information about the database. So the connections, the active connections, I don't have many now. So as Matt said, we don't have load on this database. So we need some load to see things changing. Would be kind enough, Matt, to stress our database a little bit. Uh, a little or a lot? <laughs> oh, you, you can stress a lot. Uh, I'm happy to. So let yeah, me OK. And... I got to change here. The, this is uh, the, the full. We are looking at on the metrics of PMM from the last 12 hours, right? We are not interested in the last 12 hours for now. I want you to see the last five minute, minutes what happened in our database. So I'm going to change here and I want five seconds resolution. So it, it will update our dashboard every five seconds with information that we have from the PMM. Yeah. Uh, if you can run the, the, the load. It started. Um, okay. So, so, Charlie, one thing I wanted to ask about is, um, you know, for setting up query analytics, you know, you, you, you configured PMM out of the box already, um, you know, and you set up that connection. Um, mm -hmm. did you set up PG statements or PG statmon for either of these? Well, in this one, let's take a look. Let's take a look. That's a good question. I don't quite remember if I did, but let's, let's show what is the query analytics. Well, I have a lot of red information here. A That's quite a lot. <laughs> yes. I don't like red things, you know. Uh, but actually, we do have the, the query analytics here. Okay. So the box we're using is, yeah, 130. Just to make sure I'm in the right box. Yeah, this is okay. the right box. Great. So we are collecting data ready using PMM stat statement in this case. Okay. So using your question, this is a, a nice thing that we have inside of PMM, the query analytics. So it's a really nice tool to help us to troubleshoot query performance, even though it's not the, the top for today. So we, we shall have another discussion on this topic. It's just like a, a short introduction here. So it's a tool that collects all the metrics that are exposed by PGStat statement or the Percona tool PG stat monitor. Well, most of the informations on the tools are the same, but the PG stat monitor, it uh, brings us a bit more information uh, than PG stat statement. Uh, for example, uh, we, we can have uh, the plan here, we can have the examples that, that uh, uh, from the queries that run. So a lot more information we can extract from PG stat, stat monitor. So, but that's, it's a topic for another, another talk. So let's go back to our instance, shall we? Let's go here for the Postgres. Oh, sorry. So I want to get my uh, summary. Okay. And here we have, well, we have some activities on our database. I see that you, you had a lot of uploads in the beginning. Uh, uh, we have some role change here, so role updates, 1.5 updates per second, and some deletions as well. So it looks like your load test is doing a great job, right? Around 30 to, connections. Load test yeah. is supposed to do a great job. It's supposed to tax the system. It's supposed to, and in fact, I can change the <laughs> workload if you want to see different workload. So I would know. love to. Yeah, yeah, please. Let's 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 see different workloads. So then we can compare with the remember, this is the, the full uh, settings that we have on, on Postgres, right? We have the full shared buffers, we have everything as the full. Let's 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 get another workload to see how it, it, it compares. So, so just so you're aware, um, mm -hmm. let's see, let me go ahead and I'm gonna pull up um, what I'm running. So this is a 50-50 uh, mixed workload um, with 10 users who are doing general web work and 10 users who are doing um, heavy insert, update, delete traffic. Okay. okay. So um, that's what we've got going on right now. 
Um, and we can make some modifications and changes to that. Um, let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to log in to um, my server again. And uh, we'll go ahead and... Uh, yeah, you can see it. we had a jump in number of connections and then it came back. Yes. So, um, but why don't we try tune this one? And then when that's tuned, we can try and uh, add some more workload um, to it as well. Because what I'm All really right. curious on is to see, Charlie, what sort of um, things you're going to be looking at changing from that default configuration. Because a lot of uh, folks who are watching the stream or will watch it after the fact, what they're going to do is they're going to install, um, you know, Postgres, and then they're going to assume um, that, you know, hey, um, you, you know, is this working correctly? You know, what do I need to fix? Like, what are the, the five or six things out of the box I should change, even if I don't know what my workload is or if I just have a base workload? And then obviously that workload can change over time. All right. Uh, like first things that, first. I'll set up a changed right. workload and then we'll adjust that in a second. Sure. First things first, to be able to solve a problem, we need to have a problem, right? So uh, every time that we go for settings and adjustments and turning is because we're trying to solve a problem. What is the problem that we, we, we have here? So we need to, to find out what's the problem first. So let's say, you are complaining that you, 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 can be, you can have a faster workload, right? That's your work is too, is too slow and some kind of stuff. So we can take a look from the OS point of view. This is what I'm doing here. I just going for the node summary because I want to see how the CPU is being used. I want to see if I have saturation on my CPU. I also want to see how my IO is being used if I have spikes on, on this IO, right? So looking here, looks like my CPU is, is pretty much underused, right? And well, even though I have some, let's say some, I have some spikes on CPU saturation, but it, it, it doesn't, I don't, I don't see much here, but I see that the IO is going quite a lot from time to time. I, I have some spikes on, on IO here. And we need to understand this, this IO graph because look, we, we have some data, we have our zero bytes per second here, and we have some data below and data after. So below we, we have page out and page in. So we have writes and reads, right? And when we, we just installed a, a box and the database, there's a certain rules that we need to take a look. As you asked, without checking anything, any workload, nothing, I want to see what I have on my box. So if I want to see what I have on my box, I'm going to hear for my and system. When you say what's on your box, you're talking about memory, CPU, disk, anything like that, right? Exactly. It's oh, just a, what I have. It's a lot yeah. of errors. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, we need to find out. Huh. No PMM agent running on this node. Exactly. Uh, and it is running. Uh, let's take a look. Okay. It's running here. Well, let's install it uh, force it to load again, right? So one thing that we can do, like it's saying OPMM running, right? So let's remove or let's first say I'll try, try to forcefully install it again. See, I gonna add the instance and I ask to force. So let me just check here if the IP is correct. Yeah, this IP is correct. And I mean, I think the other thing, um, you know, yeah, like, you can, like if we need to restart, like, you know, anything else on the PMM side, let me know and I can get into that. Sure. As well. Let me try to, okay, forcefully 
run it again. Okay, it says it was installed. The status, the status says everything is running. Okay, now we have node exporter, right? So before we had, we need to install the Postgres agent because we just, okay, let me see the status again. Okay. And. Yep, it's still, it was seen running before. Um, yeah. Go ahead and go back and let's see if uh, okay. that picks it up. Let's reload, right? And this is a nice thing to do live presentation or live demo. Things can go wrong. And in this case, and it's still going wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's still going wrong. Um, one second, let me go ahead and uh, um, see about that. So, the funny thing is, we get the the information here. See, yeah, you are getting the information, but you're getting a no PMM agent running on this node error, exactly. specifically on the system side. On the information, yeah, on this Which information really that we weird. need now. Yeah, that's a really weird place to get it, right? I mean, like exactly. all, the, all the places to get that, that is not the one that I would have assumed you would get it on, right? Like, so it would be kind of an all or nothing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, so this information here, just to, to get it from this information here, it runs from the T. Summary. Okay, PT summary is working fine. Because this is the information that's supposed to go there. Right. Yep. Right. So okay, uh why are you troubleshooting? why we, we we don't have here let me move on and as this is the very same information that pmm will collect so i use this uh to explain the idea right so i know nothing about your workload i know as literally nothing about your workload but i can get a lot of information from your your box from on your server and this is nothing related to postgres at this page here, I'm not talking about Postgres. I'm talking about the OS itself. Remember, in this case here, what are the things that I'm gonna, I really would like to take a look. So first of all is the CPU, okay. What are the CPUs that you have in your box? I see you have one physical CPU, four cores and four virtual cores. So it's using hyper threading. That's fine. And See here that you have different CPU speeds. It says that you have five CPUs are working at this uh, 2.499 gigahertz and then 3.099 gigahertz. So what it means is you let your kernel to decide the CPU speed of your box. On the database server, we don't want that. We want always the, the CPU to be running on the highest speed as possible, which is, uh, in our case, would be 300 here. Actually, 3372. No, this is the cache. Uh, yeah, this is a 300 with hyper threading and overclock. So we want the CPU to run as the max speed as possible. So we need to change. This is one thing that we need to change on the kernel parameters. We're gonna change it later, but let's let's keep the note. We need to improve the CPU configuration so to run it as the highest performance as possible. Okay, the next next thing that I'm gonna take a look is on the memory. Okay, we have you have memory. You don't have swap allocated. This is usually not a good thing. So. Because we don't if want you need to swap and it's not allocated then the omm starts killing things yeah and the first thing that om probably will kill is your postgres 
because the Postgres is probably the one that's going to use the most memory. So what the kernel does, it looks out, okay, who is the guy that's using all the, moment, the memory available? Oh, it's this Postgres. Kill it, right? This is one thing that we really want to have is swap because it's better to have the database is slowing down for a few minutes and we are able to troubleshoot the problem than to have the kernel killing the database because it cannot slow down. Mm. This is the mindset. You slow down your database, having time to fix the problems, much better than have a kill dash nine on your database and you can lose data, you can get the data the inconsistency, a lot of problems out of that Q-9, because this is what the kernel does, the Q-9. So we need to allocate swap. And, but remember, we don't want the kernel to be using swap if it's not necessary. And to be able to do that, this is the guy that we need to take a look, the swapness. What is the swapness? The swapness tells the kernel how likely it should use the swap. So in a desktop environment on my laptop, it's fine for the kernel to use swap because it makes things faster, actually, because my browser, for example, uses a lot of memory. So when I'm not using one of the tab of the browser, the kernel can just put everything from the swap and let other applications to use that memory, right? But we don't want that from the database. We only want the kernel to use swap on our database server if we have a problem that something really allocates a lot of memory and prevents the kernel to kill the database. This is the only time that we want to use swap, right? So we need to change the swapness to one. So to tell the kernel, yeah, you are allowed to use swap, but only when it's really, really necessary. So those are uh, very for, uh, important information that we, we get from here. And in the end of this page, we have a lot also another very important information that's this, the transparent huge pages and those are enabled by default yeah is enabled by default on the linux kernel uh, and for databases like postgres it's not a good thing mm. so what is what are huge pages uh huge pages it's a nice concept because uh remember the memory is allocated and divided in pages inside of like well, of the kernel and also from the CPU. So every time that the CPU needs to access memory, the CPU doesn't read one byte, right, as, as we might think. CPU will read the whole page. So then the CPU will divide the whole memory we have in small pages. It was fine until the point that we start to get a lot of memory available. So Remember, the kernel works with something that we, we call virtual memory, right? The memory that we see, for example, let's do a free or APS. Yes. Uh, I just want to get, oh, I already had a lot of, this guy, I just want to get whatever one KID here because I want to use the L saw. By the way, um, the PMM is working with that PMM agent, by the way. Cool. Nice. So when we, we do, we go here and we inspect things we use in tools like our soft and other tools that we, we get the, some memory addresses. Here, actually, the, the address that we get from the memory here is not a real physical address. It's a translation that is done by the kernel. And this is what we, we call virtual memory. The virtual memory is the memory that the kernel, the translation that the kernel does to make it uh, possible for the uh, manage better the memory. Let's put it on this way. Because when you run an application, for example, when you run Postgres, the kernel will give Postgres the memory that Postgres needs. And Postgres will believe it's the only application running on the kernel and has access to all the memory it needs. And this is the trick that kernel does to be able to work on this way. It uses virtual memory. 
So the application doesn't really know how much physical memory we have on the box. But the kernel needs to translate that virtual memory inside of a physical memory. So if we have one terabyte of memory, can you imagine how many blocks of four kilobytes, that's this, the full for, for memory, the, the map of the memory address is going to be really huge, huge, insanely huge. So By the, the way, guys from your, yeah. your system summary isn't updating because um, mm -hmm. you're set to five second refresh. So it's refreshing before that comes oh, back. Um, okay. Because yeah. right now the system's kind of bogged down. And so it's taking a while for the system summary to come back. And you can okay. see it little spinning in the corner there. So yeah, um, I'll change. Let okay. me change what that means. That's a good one. That's a good tip, Matt. Yeah, if if your if your refresh rate is so fast, sometimes the data doesn't return. So yeah, and here on the top is where we change the refresh rate. Yeah, nice. We have here. We have that. So the summary is uh, the 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 huge page. They change the size of the the the, the memory page from four kilobytes to a huge value. So we can have a huge block size of two megabytes, one gigabytes, and so on. So then this memory map is not so huge and the kernel can map the memory more efficiently. And mapping the memory more efficiently makes things faster. So if it's make things faster, why the transparent huge page is a bad thing? The transparent huge page, it's a bad thing because it tries to make it automatic for the application. The application doesn't know that it happens. If the application doesn't know it, the application is not prepared to, to things like that, it can cause a lot of uh, page fragmentation, memory fragmentation. Remember, database, they usually uh, work with small, small pages, small bytes inside of, of, their, of their memory cache, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a lot of fragmentation, sometimes you have, let's say we have a huge memory, but inside of that huge memory, we have a lot of space, like, like here, for example. Let's say this is the page that I use, but this is something that I need for alignment. Well, in this example here, I'm not using that much free, free page, right, if I have here. But if, if I had like smaller pieces of bytes here, see that the space between one column and another column increases. This is what will happen with memory fragmentation when we, we are using transparent huge pages. And if you have memory fragmentation, that's going to slow down the process? Not only slow down the process, it can cause out of memory problems. Mm. Because even you though you have memory for some activities. Exactly. Some, you, you might need, for example, one gigabyte memory for one activity. And even though you have one gigabyte memory available, but they're, they're splitting small pieces like this one, you cannot not allocate that one gigabyte memory. So the first thing that the kernel will try to do is swap. In our case, we have no swap. What the kernel is going to do, it's, gonna, it's running out of memory. It will just kill the database. See? The transparent huge page can lead for performance issues because you can have a lot of swap because it, 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 for the kernel, it just doesn't have memory, even though the memory is there, but the kernel is not able to allocate. And in the extreme case, it can cause the OM kill, the nasty OM kill that's gonna kill our database. So let's put it back. Let me open a text file here. So text editor. So what we have here so far, just looking at this, this information, just okay. look at this information. We see the CPU is not running off high speed. So we need to make sure the CPU runs at its max speed. So we see that you don't have swap allocated, right? Okay no swap allocated. We see that your swapness is pretty high. So swapness is too high. Okay. 
and we see that you have transparent heat page enabled. So those are four settings from the West point of view that we, we definitely need to change. Okay, so that's just the operating system. We haven't even touched the Postgres configuration. Yeah, and I have no idea about your workload. Those are workload agnostic information. Okay, right? so it doesn't so, matter what workload you're running, these four things are things that you wanna make sure that you have set from an operating system perspective out of the gate. Exactly. So those are the four things that we, we definitely need to change to make our box healthier, right? Not all of them is going to make the, the database faster, but they're going to make the box healthier and more reliable. Because remember, you want your database to keep your data healthy and reliable. You don't want your database to forget about your data, right? You don't want to lose data. Right. That's, that's not a good thing. That's a really bad thing. So this is just looking at this information that we have here, right? We didn't even push anything where you don't know about your, your, your thing. So but how we can fix those things? So we, we have a couple of... Uh, for those ones here, let me just put some changes. Uh, we are using Ubuntu. Let's start with the transparent huge pages. So for disabled transparent huge pages, we just run this command here. We tell to the kernel to never use the transparent huge page. We don't want to use the transparent huge page. Okay. Right. So for the CPU governor, this is we want to tell the kernel. There is this guy that is the governor of the CPU that it's scaling the CPU. So we can also have the CPU in high performance, or we can save uh, energy electricity slowing down the, the CPU. We want our CPU for high performance, right? Okay. So for this swap, uh, we need to create a file. I Let me check here. We don't have allocated, but yeah, we will we'll create a file. That's that I'm gonna, gonna do, we can do later. Uh, but for the swapness, uh, we can tell the system CTL to change the swapness of our bar. So for swap allocated, we need to do a DD to create a file and then allocate those guys. Let's okay. run these ones to see for now. Okay, remember you need to be root uh okay uh seems we don't have this on ubuntu it changes it is okay let's check cpu zero to see what we have Let's just find this guy. Did you want a crep governor? Is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I want to find the, 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 the file. Hmm. It's because it seems like it has a different name on Ubuntu than has on, on, Red, on Hat. Ha Red Hat, yep. Well, Google is our friend, right? Yes. <laughs> Let's, let me do the other ones first, and then Google for, okay, the swapness is for this one now. Well, if the CPU is different, might this one might be as well. Oh, no, we are in luck. And 
Okay, so what I want to do is I want to hello Google change to governor. Well, it even knows what I want to do on Ubuntu. Google is too hard. It, it's become self aware. <laughs> yeah, it, it worries me. So. Ah, oh, looks like it has its own utility. Okay. And then there's just the CPU power frequency set. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Let me see if I already have this. We already have this utility here. Nope. Uh, and now Ubuntu is helping us. See, you might find this utility that you look on this tool set here. See, this is what happens nowadays. The tools are getting too smart. They're too smart. So we're uh. one step away from Skynet. <laughs> it sometimes right. worries me a bit, right? Yeah. I, I hope we don't need Sarah. That's our corners, right? To... Oh, yep, because this is an AWS instance, you're going to need... Okay. Yeah, you're going to need to install the AWS tools. Okay. Oops. I have... FT install. All right. Because, yeah... I think I think, yep. Yeah. I think they want you to. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right, buddy. Anything else you want me? Well, keep in mind that the original uh, apt get install command that you saw, you didn't run here, right? So. Oh. oh, look at that. Okay, do you have trying to? Yes, because the user space is not load. Oh, nice. So this could be an AWS thing as well. They might not want you to set it. I don't know. It might. Let's let's go with the, the this utility. We might need, might be faster. So. I want to get, okay, seems we need to create this guy. All right, and let's disable on demand. This is the guy that tried to, to make things on demand to work. Like what is, uh, as I said, we have two, mainly alternatives. We can run it as fast as we can, that is performance, or we can run on power save right, mode, right? So the on-demand utility tries to find out how you're, uh, you're using the box and adjust on-demand, as the name say. So, but as for the database, we don't need, you don't want to adjust on-demand. We always want it as fast as we can, right? So it's, we don't with the, the, the basic change for now. There are a lot of things that we, 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 we can go on. We can go on, for example, for the IO. We can change the IO scheduler and all these kind of things that helps optimize and improve in performance. But now we want to, to go for the basic things, right? The, the most basic things that we can, we can find. And even for, for the IO scheduler, just uh, to make sure that we, we we understand so the the system summary it also shows us here somewhere it probably on top so we have file system it's also going to show us what is the io scheduler we have we we have here if it's able to to grab the information uh i was not able to find here so it's using Amazon, the, the device, the speed. 
yeah, it was unable to collect rate information and I can't find the, yeah, it was not able to collect the IO scheduler. So in some, some kernels, it's able to collect the IO scheduler. So the IO scheduler works, tell the, the IO subsystem how it wants to, to, to write and read the, the things. It's a bit more to what we're looking for today. We're not going so deep today. We're just going for, for, for the, the, the surface, right? The right. basic information. And those are the things that we already got for here. So only doing those things, we make our box more reliable, right? And we might get a bit of uh, performance improvement. But the idea, the first idea is reliability. So our box is more reliable. So now that I get more, the box more reliable, I'm going to start looking at the Postgres. And not the, the first time, and I don't want to care too much about the, the workload that we have, right? I just want to check the, the summer of my database and to see from those four or five uh, uh, things that we, what we can do. So, and the first one that I like to take a look is on the shared buffers. The, the full value for the shared buffers, they're, they're really small. Remember, it was defined when memory was expensive and it's cars. Now we have a lot more memory. So in our example, your the full value for the shared buffers is 128 megabytes. So what is a good value for the shared buffer? Do you know what is a, would be a good value for the shared buffer? 50% uh, to 70% of your memory? Uh, why? Because... You know, that, that that will give you the ability to grow. I mean, typically you want your hot data all in shared memory, right? Well, that's true. And w w what is hot data, by the way? Uh, data that's accessed uh, at a high frequency. Right, correct. <laughs> uh, you know, it might be stupid questions, but those are the definitions that you need to make before you start moving, right? So... Yeah, we want our hot data that data is frequently accessed and maybe change it in memory. Uh, and you said 50 to 75%, right? Yes. That's usually good for other database systems. For example, MySQL, that would be a really good approach. But by the full on Postgres, we don't want to be that high because Postgres doesn't. Even though Postgres has the shared buffer, it works more like a catch from the OS. It relies a lot on the OS buffers. Mm, okay. It's not like MySQL. MySQL and other database, it does what we call direct IO. So it just bypass the kernel buffer, the OS buffer, goes direct to the disk, get all the data it needs and manages inside its own buffer. So, right, so it manages its own buffer and goes direct to the disk. The Postgres doesn't do that. Postgres relies all the I.O. to the kernel. So we still have a lot of data inside of the kernel buffers. If we set the Postgres buffers too high, then we have a smaller buffer for the I.O. operations from the kernel perspective. And it might make your, your workload slow, especially if you have a really uh, right intensive workload. If a right intensive workload, you might want to get your shared buffer much smaller than like around 5% of, of memory that you have. Because most of the things gonna go for the kernel buffer, and the kernel just decides when it wants to flush from, from its buffer to the disk, right? Right. And, but still, yeah, we still need to improve. Uh, I want to, to give you this web page here that help us with some settings. It's really nice, uh, PGTune web page. 
right? It, it will show us some base configuration, but besides is we need to understand why it's given the settings. So the database I'm using is 13, I'm using Linux. Well, let's say I'm using more for web application. We have 32 gigabytes max run, eight CPU cores, and how many connections max we were sending a uh, match um, for the distance? Well, how many do we want? Right now there's only 20 running, but um, we can go 50, 100, so, you know. Well, let's put 150, right? So okay. I want to stress the database. So, okay, it will give some numbers here for us. Well, the first one is the max connections. Well, this is the number we, we gave to them. So it's, it's not in here. And the first one that I, it pops up on my, on my eyes is this shared buffer. That is exactly what we're talking here. Okay. See, it gave eight gigabytes run for our case. So it's far less than the 50%. Right? Indeed. And, and the reason is exactly the one that I just explained to you. So in a web application or on a lab transaction, most of the operations, uh, actually we have mixed operations. We don't, it's not only a very write intensive operations. We also have a lot of reads operation. So, from the reads, if we have the data closer to the database, which is on the database shared buffers, it's much faster. The database can use that in a very fast way, and we don't compromise too much the, the OS cache. But keep in mind, those are suggestions. It's, it's by no means strict values, those are suggestions that we can use. So we can start with eight gigabytes. So let's put here, I'm gonna get this, this value here. So for our configuration, let's start with eight gigabytes, that's fine. Uh, another one that it pops up here are these effective cache size. Yep. You know what it does? And it says 24 gigabytes, it's quite high, it's not? Yeah, is it the file system cache? Mm, the estimated file really. system cache that's available? Actually, it's it's an est uh, estimation. You are correct that it's, it's an estimation, but it's an estimation of how much memory in total the database can use, mm -hmm. including the file system cache. Yeah. Right. So, so, so it's the shared buffers plus what's available for file system cache um, without what's left for the OS and anything else it's running. Exactly. And why is it important? So you don't over allocate. Why? Well, but you 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 never over allocate if you if you put a hard value of eight gigabytes memory here. This no, we need to keep in mind this true. value here. That's not true because each connection is going to have its own memory as well. Agree, agree. And so if each memory has its own connection, if it's not so true. Or each connection has its own memory, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you cannot really put a hard limit, right? Yeah. So, but that's not the case. That's not the point. This value here, it does nothing about memory allocation. It doesn't allocate anything, and it doesn't put any hard limit for memory allocation. This is a guidance for the, the, the optimizer to understand how much memory it can have and if it's better to go with indexes or not indexes, if it's better to, to go do a full table scan, and if it's likely to get the data in memory or not. It's just a guidance for the optimizer. What it changes, it might change is the optimized plan when you're running your query. But it does not allocate any of this doesn't memory. Of anything doesn't make any yeah. modifications yeah. or anything else. No, nothing. And it's just for guidance on when you go for the optimizer, right? So for the other side, the maintenance work, it does allocate memory. And what it does, 
So remember, we have a lot of operations that we do on Postgres, for example, the vacuum, or when we create an index, or we do some operations, maintenance operation. That's why it has the name, my maintenance work man, right? So for those maintenance operations, we need to allocate memory. Yes. And this is the memory that will be allocated. It doesn't make your queries to run faster. It makes your maintenance operations run faster or slower, depending on the configuration, right? So this is what it does, right? So <clears throat> I, I gonna, well, let's go here. I was about to skip this one, but let, let's go here. Uh, because for now, I don't want to care about the checkpoints, the, 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 the target. Uh, I gonna, one thing that is usually not commonly talked during the optimizations and planning sessions is this guy here. And it can make a lot of difference from the queries and optimization. And the, I mean, the optimizer and I, when I run in queries, this is the random page cost. Do you know what it does? I mean, it's just a cost optimizer change, right? So it's going to, you know, push, um, you know, random pages uh, to be a bit more costly. So it's going to favor um, sequential, right? Yeah, but why? because sequential reads are going to uh, be faster for most disks and most systems. That's correct. But what does it have to do with the database? Well, that, I mean, like I mentioned, it's the optimizer side. Yeah, but like, what is the, 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 the result? Let's say, what happens if I change this value to four, for example, that's, if I'm not wrong, is that the, the, the foo is four. Let's, let's check. Our configuration here. It's well, random, random pages. Um, you're going to get better with uh, indexes or certain types of indexes. Um, okay. Because you're going to do a deep dive into the index, right? That's correct. That's correct. So, yeah, the defu is four. So, uh, to be able to really fully understand this, this setting here, we need to understand how Postgres stores data and how Postgres stores the indexes, right? So the Postgres, it stores data, uh, the, the, the data files, it's just sequential data it's stored, right? So it doesn't work like MySQL, for example, that's use, uh, stores data or organize it based on a key on the MySQL is the primary key. Right. So it's a right? clustered index that's it's, basically used in MySQL. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't use clustered uh, storage here, right? So it's this is the thing. The data when it's stored on, on Postgres is not clustered. It doesn't organize the data. So it's, it's just keeps writing the data is just like we're doing here on uh, on this file. So right. I'm just so putting just continually it pens and you know and that's why you have exactly. to come back and clean up old data because there's spaces. That's what the vacuum does for you. Yes. And why we have spaces like for example let's let's put here data one let's just put some random thing here data two Data three, new data, and data five, right? So I have here data time. I have 15 lines, right? And why, let's say, let's imagine this is, is, is the data file for the Postgres. Why uh, it creates empty spaces here, as you just described? Because it's faster to you know bark it for deletion then come back later and clean it up exactly for example if let's say i want to update data two to data 20. so what postgres does is let's put its mark here as deleted right yep. so 
copy this guy and in the end it puts 20. But I still don't have an empty space here. Right. Do I? No. I, well, no. It's marked for. Yeah. It's marked for deletion. And as you mentioned, we have the process that is the vacuum. In the case auto vacuum, it will come here and I just vacuum this table. That one that was marked for deletion, it's now deleted. This line is now empty. Right. right? So, but remember, the database reads everything in blocks. In, in case of Postgres, it reads, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 16 kilobytes blocks. But let's say we have every blocks here are four lines. So I have one, one, two, three, four, two. So I have one, two, three, four, five blocks, right? So on the, the, la uh, the last block, I have three lines that are empty, so empty space, and I have one empty space here on, on the block one. Yep. Right? So this is what happens with the vacuum. So on Postgres, every time that we do a select, it does a full table scan. What it does, it's, it goes to the disk, reads all the blocks, put in memory. It's pretty fast. Or if I do a select, and let's say I want the data five, right? It will scan all my table. Here, block one, there is no data five. Block two, there is no data five. Oops, on block three, I have data five. What it does, it reads the whole block, put in memory, and keep going. It's, it's sequential. As you said, it's a sequential scan. Right, right, right. sequential. And when it goes for index, what it does, it creates a B3 index in most of the cards. So when we create an index, like for example, a B3, it's not sequential anymore, right? We have RAM on page. So we might have uh, one, three, five, nine, seven, six, whatever, how the page is organized. And so if I do a select and try to find the data five, and the data five is on the line 13, let's say it's here. It goes to the B3, it's find the line where it is randomly. Remember, it's not sequential anymore. It's random reads. Yep. It's find the line, then go sequentially for the line 13 and, and read all my page. So I'm changing a sequential access to a random access whenever I use an index on Postgres. Right. Which means that in this case, random page cost, like we, like we mentioned, is yeah. going to improve the um, index uh, in, in the- Usage, index. exactly. Yes. Because it, it, it will prefer indexes, so it changes the cost optimizer to prefer random pages or index scans over sequential. Exactly. And this can change a lot uh, can improve or decrease performance a lot, right? Because we can just go for a select. Let's get to your database. Do you have a, a, a nice select that you can send to me that oh, they can run I in your database? Nice take, take a look at PM. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go you have to lots of my nice square analytics. Yeah, I still don't. Yeah, yeah I still wonder. Those, that's really strange. Um, yeah. the templating errors. I, I don't know what's going on there. Unless uh, there's an update that I didn't apply, which I guess is possible. Yeah, I can always have. Um, I've never, I've never seen those before. Uh, so I'm going, I'm going for this one, right? So. Let's see the query distribution. Hmm, it's yeah, not giving examples me examples with uh, exactly. doing stat statements. I don't think. I think it's only. Yeah, that's true. We need to do stat monitoring. So, exactly. but, but you can, if you look at the query itself, um, you can take the, the the thing, and it should be fairly easy to reconstruct it. Um, just look at the whole query. Um, 
like the uh, the uh, what's the yeah yeah. Uh, they are here. This is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I need yeah, to buy then, a new then, mouse. This one. Yeah, then then you could just take you know the th there's only one value, so just pick a value like a thousand or something, um, okay. you know, for the 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 parameter, and that should be fine. So I can just put. Yeah, that should be. Yeah. The, yeah okay. Fine. So uh, what I want to do here is. Let's run and explain. Uh, where is my database? I suppose I'm connected here. Uh, are you using the, uh, the test table? The first one, though. First one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's connect here. I need to copy my queries again. So I want to do an ex first. Let's let's start with an explain, right? It didn't paste here. Now it pasted twice. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's once. Yeah. Uh, so I have my, ex my explain here. So if we go here, it's doing a bitmap index scan and do a hip bitmap hip scan. Okay. We 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 have those those guys here. We're, we're still using index. Right, so let's understand where, where is the table. This is the table. Let, oops, the opposite. Let's see how your table is organized. So, on your table, you have the primary key that's a, a B3, and you also have the comment that's another B3. Cool. And what is your query doing? It's searching for one AI, uh, my ID. Yeah. Which is uh, that, that second index that you had. Uh, so I suppose the size of this table, let's just select count stuff. You misspelled count. <laughs> It's always hard to have someone looking over your shoulders. No, actually, my my keyboard. See, uh, sometimes it does work, and sometimes it mis mistype, and sometimes it types twice. Oh, you need a new I keyboard. Really, I do, and well, I I bought a mechanical one that was quite expensive, thinking that would be a good fit, but looks like it's not working at all, and just. It runs in problem after the, the warranty expired. So yeah, you know how things work. Yeah. So, uh, so Fried, uh see that you just joined. Um, you know, we haven't really got dug into monitoring. We did set up PMM uh, early on, just a, a, a quick, you know, setup, but uh, we can cover the installation of PMM if you want um, at, at, a, at another stream. But uh, right now we're, we're kind of bouncing between PMM and uh, the shell here. Um, for everything. Yep. But uh, we we can you know we can definitely do some some uh, help and show you some ways to get PMM up and running in your environment. We might not cool. be able to do it today, but we can get it done. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So just to understand that parameter here, uh, as we see here, we. This table is quite large, right? So we have a few two million almost rows two, here. Almost two million, yeah. Yeah, we have two million rows here, so that's fine. And uh, in this case, look that we are only looking for one very specific ID, right? We are running for for one very specific ID. Uh, we probably don't like we get how many? Let's see how many rows it returns. So only eight rows. Well, the worst case scenario that might happen is each of these rows here be in one single page inside of the database. 
So then it needs to go to the index, find out all the pages, and then go to the, the, the data file and randomly select those five pages. Right? It's not as it's not that bad because uh what where is the table name? So if I if we have here select UI. OID and then we can just do a max OID. Did you so want I, did you want my column, the AI my ID? No, I want the city city ID, I suppose. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, this is the one. So what you have here, this is the page number. See this the this table here, it has forty nine thousand. 713 pages inside of the, the data file. This is how many pages we have inside of this data file. And as I said, as we're getting eight rows from the index, the worst case scenario, we need to find eight pages because each row is in a different page, right? So eight pages out of 49,000 pages, that's not bad, right? So we had really a huge performance gain if we go for the index in this case, find out what's the information, and then we come back to the, the data file. Because we are avoiding to read 49,700 pages. Right. We're skipping them all using your index. That's why the database it choose to use your index because it's a lot better to go for the index and then come back to the data files because the, the cost is, is, a, is a lot more efficient. The thing is, we can make it looks like a lot worse if we change the random page cost. Let's say we put here 5,000 for, for the random page cost. It will probably, oops, sorry, probably from the database side, we'd say, man, it's so expensive, but so expensive to, to do a random page that I prefer to go through the whole data set, do a full table scan, and just get those five different pages here and do random pages. Right. So this is why you want to make sure you get that one right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And to be able to get it right, you need to understand what kind of disks you have. In this case, as we are using AWS, we suppose you have SSDs and NVMe and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. We have really fast disks. So, and that's why we put here, the cost for the random page is almost the cost of the, sequ the sequential page, right? The change is not that high. So yeah, the database can favor a lot more going to the indexes than doing a full table scan. Okay, so, so Charlie, so what we've got so far um, is we've got several changes that you recommended for the OS. Yep. Um, you recommend changing the shared buffers to eight gigs, um, uh, which which we talked about. Um, we mentioned the effective cache we could change, but it's not going to really make a material difference other than on the optimizer slightly. Um, so you know that's an option. Um, the uh, the 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 random page cost is one that we think could be a big win for us, just because the default is so high compared to sequential, um, lowering that by default is probably a good thing. Yep. That's correct. Okay. So given that, so what other basic kind of changes would you recommend? Okay. Uh, let's just get some overview here. Remember that I saw a lot of uh, IOs uh, What where was that? 
Uh, tuples, you are writing a lot of tuples yeah, down here on the uh, node summary, right? We saw a lot of IO here, right? This activity. So one thing that we can change on Postgres is the synchronous commit. Okay. So, but remember, there is a trade-off. So the synchronous commit, it will pause a the the database to commit uh, every time to, to the cache to, to the kernel every time that you you do a commit in your transaction right is a trade off that we can improve performance but you lose a little bit on, on reliability so you might have for example one second data loss depends on your on your configuration so and but there is one thing that I really I always uh, discuss when we're talking about those trade-offs because there is one setting on, on Postgres. I want to show the settings here. And I want to tell you, never, ever change this guy. <laughs> the F-Sync. Never change the F-Sync. Exactly. So the default for F-Sync is on. So, and if you see, it's just on top of the synchronous commit, right? Because they're highly related. So the, the synchronous commit, it's the, the level on how long the database will wait for the data to be persisted in the disk. So see that we have one, two, three, four, five values here, right? We have synchronous commit off, so it doesn't wait for the the kernel to reply back if it was successfully or not when you do the commit right so it what it does is you let's say you do a uh, insert in that table mm -hmm. so when you finish the insert you do the commit it will immediately come back to you it doesn't matter if the kernel was able to write or not to the disk the database doesn't care you just want performance Right, so you have the local uh, option, the local and the own option. They are mainly the same. So what it does is, when you do the commit, it will ask to the kernel for look. I'm writing this down. Flush it to the disk. Well, the, 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 it's not flush to the disk. It will write to the kernel, and we wait back to the kernel to see if the kernel replies back with success or failure. So if the kernel reply back, for now, yeah. It's on the disk, then the database is fine for yeah, yeah. Look, it's on the disk, it's we are good to go. So reply back to the application. The remote, if we really want your data to be persisted and you have a replication, you can tell to the postgres, look, every time that I commit something, I want you to send to the replication and wait for the replication to also commit. To have this local one, so then reply that guarantees back. consistency between your replica and your your primary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it guarantees that the replica written it to its buffer, right? So to its wall file, it didn't apply yet. Which is the next right? one? Which is remote apply? Which is actually the next one? So the next one is remote apply. So it will send to the replica, wait for the replica to apply the commit and reply back. So as you can imagine, this is the slowest one, but it gives the, the highest level of guarantees that you have that data safely stored. But right now we don't have a replica. No, so we can, well, and we, we can later on, Maybe not today, but in the, in the next call, we can just turn it off and see how impact, how much impact we have, right? Uh, for and, the and synchronous I mean, comments. You know, we'll probably want to set up replicas eventually, right? So yeah. if we go go through, and our goal for for those who are watching or listening is, we, we want to kind of walk through all the different stages. So we'll we'll show backups one time. We'll show tuning queries. So we're going to kind of roll through different topics in the Postgres space here. Um, with the same setup. 
So we're going to save these instances in the next stream. We'll continue on this journey of figuring out mm -hmm. what uh, we need to configure. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And coming back, remember that I said to the F-Sync, never ever touch this guy. So the F-Sync uh, instructs the kernel to flush the data to the disk. So it's make sure that when the kernel replies back, the data, when the kernel flushes the data, it does safely flush the data. So if you disable the F-Sync, you might have some performance. You're going to have some performance uh, benefits. And you might have the same performance benefit with the synchronous commit. The thing is now your write to the disk is not safe enough. It's not atomic enough when you write to the disk. Yeah. You can have disk corruption. And, that, and that's really based on the disk has its own cache and its own, you know, um, you know, systems going on and you're, you're basically relying on it to do everything for you instead of forcing that right to be consistent. Yeah. So it's fine to, to work and tune and play around the synchronous commit we can have, but it's, it's good, but it's the, for the F-Sync configurations and all, and I always enforce this because I've seen a lot of tutorials and recommendations on the internet. Well, just disable the F-Sync and then you're gonna have a lot of performance improvement. That's very silly to say the least. Unless you can lose your data. Oh, yeah. if, if you don't care about your data, that's, that's true. So yeah. then you don't need to use a database, right? You can have just everything in, in memory. Go for Redis. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not saying Redis is a bad tool. It's an amazing tool. It's just a memory database, right? So you, you don't care about uh, the safety of your data. Yeah. Fahid wants to know, uh, what about uh, ZFS uh, as it can eliminate uh, bit rot and disk corruption issues? Well, uh, I haven't played around those things, uh, so I cannot comment on them. I've been reading. We might be able to get Eve to talk to that. We do, yeah. I've, I've, reading, I've been reading a lot of uh, tops on, on ZFS and other consistent file system, you know. Uh, but there's always have a trade-off, right? Always have a trade-off. Uh, and for the database, we usually trade performance uh, to get reliability and consistency, right? And this, but this is a long and huge fight between the trade-off of reliability, consistency, and performance, right? But yeah, it, this is definitely a good topic. Another topic that probably we we will step on later sooner or later is about uh, encryption, right? How do we do encryption on a database? So how can we go for that? Oh. Because it's a pretty hot topic nowadays. Char Char Charlie, you're, 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 you're jumping all over, right? <laughs> we, yeah. we can't get to that yet, but um, we might be able to, you know? to, to ask Eve that question. So, so he, we have a kind of a resident ZFS expert and Stabby loves ZFS and he just yeah. loves to play with it. So um, we could probably ask him his opinion um uh specifically on you know it for postgres um but he's written a couple of blogs that are interesting in case you want to check out uh zfs on uh the percona blog uh, yeah. cool so remember matt everything that we did here are independent from your workload right even though we check at a couple of, uh, of graphs here to see how the database is behaving because we, we want to, to have a way to compare the before and after. So, but the good thing is as we are using PMM, we can just go back in time, right? So uh, we can compare. But at the moment, everything that we, we did here, they are independent from your workload, right? But they are good practice and recommendations. So again, there are no strict rules that you should, if you have 32 gigabytes of memory, use eight gigabytes for your shared buffer. That's not such a thing, right? You need to understand your database. Oh, that's the one that like the recommendations we are using. After we do all of those things, we need to come back again, run the load test again, and then do the fine tuning on top of those, those very same parameters. Because we can, we can get worse performance instead of better performance. Yeah. Um, my, my, remember how I mentioned at the beginning of this that the 
heating's getting fixed. Uh, the guy's knocking on my door right now. So I'm trying to get my daughter to go let him in, um, <laughs> you know, which is always fun. Um, but no, uh, so, you know, let me go ahead and do that. Um, and if you can maybe talk a little bit about wall, um, and the, the, any of the default settings is wall changing the wall settings, something that you would wait till you have more workload, or would you do that out of the gate before you have really looked at workload? Uh, I usually like to have more, more workloads when going for, for wall settings. Okay. So, uh, so to understand a bit more. So the, there's know, a couple how, different things here, right? So the ones that you've recommended are pretty generic and for exactly. without the workload, you know, let's look at, you know, these things. So, you know, we we've we've mentioned, you know, um half a dozen, you know, settings for Postgres and the OS. Um those ones are all, hey, regardless of what workload, you should look at changing those. But wall and a few of the others you're going to look at what are those the, the that that workload before you change it yeah uh one thing that i i like to i would like to to, to pinpoint here let me see if our we are collecting here so yeah the checkpoints right so every time that we when you go for looking for wall configurations one thing that we really want to to improve and optimize are the checkpoints. Okay. We, we don't want to have checkpoints happening too frequently, uh, but we don't want them to be too sparsely either because if we have a checkpoint that is very sparse, if the database crashes when it recovers, it can take a, a longer time to, to recover back, right? Okay. So it's so again, the, the, the trade-off that we have here. Uh, but if you have the checkpoint happening too frequently, we're going to have a lot of high O and the database performance is going to suffer a lot, right? But they are dependent from the workload. They are highly dependent from the workload. And, but looking here from the graph that we, that we have, can you see that from, let me get here instead of five minutes, I'll put like 30 minutes. Can you see that at some point, didn't refresh yet. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, okay. This is a better view. Let's just improve. Can you see that at some point here, we have a lot more checkpoints happening and taking longer than from other points. Mm -hmm. So here, if we took a, take a look, probably your application is writing more intensively during those times here. That's why we have a lot more checkpoints. And <clears throat> on this point here, you, we probably had your application is still writing, but they are not writing so much at the very same point. So then we are reaching the checkpoint timeout probably. Right? right. So those are usually the things that we need to take a look. So are the checkpoints happening three frequently? What is the, the frequency of the checkpoints? Every one minute, every seconds, or every 10 minutes, every one hour. So are they happening too frequently? Because what we want to have is we want the checkpoint to happen at the checkpoint timeout, right? We want the timeout to be uh, the, 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 the time space that allows the application to evenly distribute the, 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 the load, the data. Okay. Because what happens is when we write into the database, it has a background uh, thread or process that's working with the, the OS that is uh, flushing the data to, to, to the OS kernel, to the OS, right? So, if the, the checkpoint uh, configuration is too minimalist, that guy is not able to keep up pushing during the time. And then eventually we will get the threshold and then we have a, a huge flush. It's a flushing too much, too much, right? This is the checkpoint. Right. And we want the, the database to just keep flushing slowly, but in, in a nice pace that it doesn't need to flush 
too frequently. And when it flushes, we don't see those high peaks. Those high peaks are not good either. Let's go to the 15 minutes here. So those high peaks means that the current, the, 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 it was not able to keep flushing. And eventually when it did it flush it a lot, it needed to do a lot of operations per second. So we want it to be sparse and as even as possible. So the database is just keep flushing, keep sending data to the OS, keep sending data to the OS. And it, it can run like a pretty faster. So I think we, 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 we can leave it running for, for some time and then we, 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 can, we come back okay. for those configurations. So what I'm thinking, Charlie, is we, we're, you know, we're, we're at an hour and a half now. So we should probably wrap this stream up. Um, yep. And what I'd like to do for the next stream is, you know, take the changes that you've recommended and actually mm -hmm. apply them. And yes. we can look at the before and after. Right. Um, I think that's that's critical because, you know, we've got things running. So what we'll do um, in prep for the next live stream is we will start our workload, um, you know, uh, uh, a couple hours before the stream, let it run. We'll make the changes, um, restart the database during the stream, and then we'll watch and look at the deltas. That sounds great. And why do we, we look at the, 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 the deltas and then we can also go for the other parameters, right? Like the, the checkpoints and the wall right, files. Because then we'll have the and workload and you can you can analyze the workload a bit more. Exactly. Uh, that, yeah. that would be a lot useful. And for those who are watching, um, you know, I appreciate you hanging out here. Um, for those who are watching uh, recorded, um, you might have missed, I, I we, we had a snafu with the configuration today where we actually duplicated our streams. And so there was one stream that was active, one stream that wasn't. Um, and so we need to figure that one out. So this is uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, we apologize for. Um, we also didn't stream to LinkedIn, even though we wanted to, because um, I don't know if this was a change setting or what, but I got an error that, uh, you know, only a certain frames per second was supported by uh, LinkedIn streaming. Now I streamed to LinkedIn two weeks ago, no problem with the same setup. <laughs> so something has changed between two weeks ago and today where um, what I did stream didn't work anymore. So got to figure that one out. That one's a little weird. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we'll come back um, and, you know, we're going to continue to try and do these on a regular basis. Um, you, you know, we, we have a request to do a PMM installation from the start to the end. Um, you know, so we'll go ahead and we'll get that set up as well, um, as well as uh, continuing with MySQL, Postgres, Mongo um, streams that will show you how to install, configure, and what's important out of the box. And then we'll go through normal operations like uh, setting up replication or doing a backup or doing something else. So, all that right. Sounds great. All right, Charlie, thank you for hanging out. Um, and don't forget to uh, subscribe um, to the channel um, so you'll get notified when these things happen again. So uh, thanks for hanging out, everybody. Bye-bye. Well, thanks, Matt, for having me here. Thanks, everybody. Have a great 